Cain is, yes. Uh, you haven't spent any time in prison, have you? Uh, no. 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 no Shocking will I. fact. A lot of people would think you'd been in jail. No. Were you ever in any... Well, you can hold on to that while we're talking. It's not a microphone, but it's not, a, it's not an ice cream cone. Yeah. But I'm sure people lick it. So we're going to... So, actually, we'll have you sign it, too. We're going to do a whole promotion with this piece. But were you in trouble? I mean, here you were just mentioning about the fact that you were typecast and you played bad Arabs and bad, you know, Indians and just bad dudes. Um, but were you a bad guy? Are you, like, were you in trouble? You look I'm, like you robbed something. I'm not a bad guy. I've never spent a day in jail. Hmm. Just lucky or? Yeah, I'm quick. <laughs> Actually, when I was a kid, okay, this is a story. In high school, we were having a party at a friend's house, and there was all kinds of booze, and, uh, and somebody called in a noise complaint. <clears throat> and I heard the sirens coming, okay? And I said, we're getting busted, all right? <laughs> so everybody's running around trying to escape and everything, and I ran out the back door of the house, and I jumped over the back fence into the alley, and the cop car was coming right down the alley, right towards me. And I ran up to the cop car, okay? <laughs> and I said, thank God you guys are here. These college guys came in and they started with, they had brought booze with them and everything and they're messing around with the women. God, thank God you guys are here. He said, kid, can you get home on your own? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I don't live far from here. He said, okay, you just go home. That's a great scam, running towards a police car. Yeah. Now, was this around the time of Spider Baby? No, 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 I was in high school. Oh, because you look still a little, you know, you look, I mean, I guess you looked like a bad guy, so you became typecast. Absolutely. Now, here, speaking of parties and drugs and drinking, here's a lovely photo of you um, smoking Oops. weed. Yes. And I, I, I can't even hold on to it. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, now, I wanted to show this. First of all, what movie is that from? This is from uh, Devil's Rejects. All right, we're going to talk about that film. Okay. Before we get to that... Um, I wanted to mention a movie uh, that you just recently made called High on the Hog. Right. You produced it as well as starring in it. I was, was a producer, yes. What is the plot line for High on the Hog? The plot line for High on the Hog is about this hog farmer, okay, whose farm has been in the family for five generations. And he's just kind of supplementing his income a little bit because times are hard by growing weed. And in the process of his life, he's run into these women who have been um, just tortured and, and, and humiliated and battered in and, and, and every way, way possible, and he, he's taken them in as family. And um, everything goes along great until... Until some, it doesn't. Huh? <laughs> Until it doesn't. Until it doesn't. Now, yes. it's a fun film. Um, I've, I've seen it. We're actually, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of a long story, but there's a lot of people looking at rights. There's some things being reshot for the film. Yeah. yeah. But you're terrific in it. And you kind of play a good guy-ish for most of the movie, kind of. Yeah, I play a good guy until I get pushed. And then mm -hmm. when I get pushed, I push back. I can just push back a little harder than the guy who's doing the pushing. Now, you're, you're a pusher. You're not a pushover. <laughs> just wanted to show, I mean, a lot of people, you had a resurrection in your career. You basically got to a point, I understand, where you'd done all these kind of roles, and you just had enough, and you kind of quit the business. Tell us about why you stopped working, retired. I just basically backed away because I got so tired of playing the same stupid heavies. I mean, there was a point at which I was doing a show at, I think it was Warner Brothers, and it was a modern day cop show. The only thing was, it was originally a western that they had done years before. Gunsmoke. <laughs> and they just put us in modern clothes mm -hmm. and it was the same script, okay? And I said, you know what? This is the beginning of the end, okay? I can't keep doing this. I'm sorry, all right? Uh, I try to be realistic about who I am and what, I, what it is that I can do. Uh, and I just felt that I could do better than what I was being offered. 
And so that being the case, I decided to just kind of step away until I found somebody with a little intelligence. And that was? Quentin Tarantino. Okay. I got a call at home from Quentin. I don't know how he got my phone number. It's like when you're Quentin Tarantino, <laughs> you're the CIA. Get me Sid Haig. Okay. <laughs> Boom. Uh, <laughs> and he said, I know, I got it. You don't want to play any stupid heavies. He's sat in the I've written a part for you. It's part of a judge. And I won't take no for an answer. Okay. You just, you have got to play this role. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I, I found somebody with a little intelligence. Okay. A lot. Nothing really happened after that because it was a, sm a small thing. And the thing is, it was, I think it was in a way him trying to see if people were really paying attention. Okay. Uh, because of course that, that was Jackie Brown and Pam Greer was in it. Yep. He never told Pam that I had been cast in that role. And when she showed up on the set and saw me, she started laughing like crazy. She, I mean, she hit the floor, okay? <laughs> and, it, and it was a, a reunion. Nice. We hadn't seen one another in 27 years, and it was like we had lunch the day before. Because all of the stuff that we did in the Philippines together just made us so tight and and you know we had one another's back you you, you know oh, excuse me you're about to step on a snake okay <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh we had that bond and it just it was it was great it's nice yeah. hearing this story as you're holding on still to Tara Patrick's butthole yes which is makes it particularly special now you got a call from someone else let's show this picture and this, of course, became a major change in Sid Higgs career. Who called you for that one? Rob Zombie called me for that one. Actually, this is the second one I did for right. him. Right. Well. That's the first. This is House of a Thousand. Yes. Sorry. This is House of a Thousand Corpses. Hold it up next to your face, just so we can see. Was that with makeup, or that was just? <laughs> <laughs> Wise guy. <laughs> um, and I got a call from my agent, and he said, okay, here's the deal. I went, ah, shit, what? <laughs> and he goes, you go to this office building on Wilshire Boulevard. Oh, I'm so impressed. And you sign a letter of nondisclosure. Take the script home. Read it. If you like it, the part is yours. Okay. Without an audition. Right. Got it. Those are the best. And I said, well, now somebody's really doing some thinking. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I took the script home, and I read it. And I loved it. I said, I can have so much fun doing this. Let's, let's get this done. That movie was? House of a Thousand Corpses. Right. And the very first time I met Rob Zombie was in the wardrobe department we were, when we were actually getting our fittings. We had never even met before. Um, How was that film to work on and work with Rob? What was it like? It was great. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, Rob was very um, uh, relaxed kind of guy. Uh, however, he knew what he wanted, and he was able to make his vision uh, clear to everybody that was working. And then he just did what directors should do. He stepped back and let you do your work. How much of uh, Captain Spaulding is you, and how much was the script? A lot of Captain Spaulding was me, mm -hmm. just because I felt that he was this particular type, this personality type. And Rob had written that into the script, mm -hmm. and I just kind of tweaked words here and there to just kind of juice things up a little bit. And to surprise him, Rob, with some things that uh, he had. He hadn't thought of, like when the guys come in to rob my store and whatnot, and the guy says, stick them up, and I went like this, okay? <laughs> that wasn't in the script, okay? Rob fell out. He, he ruined the take, sound take. Had take two, I went, okay. The clown makeup was part of the script, right? Or was that oh, yes. That was, no, that, he designed this face, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, that, was total, that was totally him. And um, any other crazy stories from uh, making the Devil's Rejects? Was it a smooth shoot? Was it? 
uh, challenging. Devil's Rejects, the, the Devil's Rejects has got a companion disc with it called mm -hmm. 30 Days in Hell. <laughs> and it was because for 30 days that it took to shoot that film, it never got below 105 degrees. Oh my God. Yeah. And I have now a special appreciation for women who wax. Because with all the dried blood and everything on my shirt, every time I took my shirt off, my chest came with it. A lot yeah. of people don't know that that blood is uh, painful. It's very sticky, and if you get it between things, you can't pull things apart without ripping your skin. It's it's corn syrup and, and mm -hmm. food coloring. Yeah. Okay, so a terrible feeling in the heat and then flies. Yeah, that is good for the character, though. Yeah, you used it. Yeah. Now, how did that lead into? Well, let's see. This is. Where's the other picture? Oh, the one that we were showing before, yeah. which is from the Devil's Okay, Rejects. so, um, first of all... Um, and he, how, he passed away, by the way, the gentleman yes, that I thought of. Yes, yes. Matt McGuire. I have mm -hmm. a tribute to him, as a matter of fact, on my website. Mm -hmm. www.sidegg.com. Thank you. Plug, plug. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Universal did put up the money and everything for uh, House of the Thousand Corpses. They had their own producer on the set every day. They watched dailies every day. There were notes all the time and da da da. da. And uh, the film was completed, and they were doing screenings around the country. And they, the survey cars were coming back great. They were either fives or ones, okay, <laughs> which is exactly what you want. Yeah. You don't want to bust your ass making a film and have middle. somebody say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. You want them to run out of the theater or tell all their friends about it. Yeah. Or both. Um, so uh, the head of the studio at that time said, well, maybe I should go and see one of these screenings. And Rob, in his innocence, because this was his first real feature film, I mean, he'd shot a lot of music videos before. Uh, <clears throat> said, yeah, come on down. So the film is over, and they find this woman, who's the head of the studio, uh, in the lobby, crying and shaking uncontrollably. Somebody had to take her home. Okay. The next morning, she called Rob in and said, there's no way that we can release this film. <laughs> it uh, it's terrible from every level. It's 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 morally corrupt. Okay, my kind of film. Yeah. So Rob is doing um, one of those interview things on MTV where stars are interviewing stars. Right. And he's with Ben Affleck, and they're talking about his film. And Ben says, you know, "Forget about that. What about your film?" He says, "Well, Universal turned it down because they thought it was morally corrupt." And uh, but it, uh, the good part is that MGM has picked it up. And he said, "Well, if Universal thought it was morally corrupt, why would MGM pick it up?" And as a joke, he said, "Well, I guess MGM doesn't have any morals." And you could hear everybody, all of the crew, laughing. Okay, it was a joke. Okay, the next day. They went in and shredded everything that had to do with House of a Thousand Corpses. And then who wound up releasing it? Lionsgate. Well, they were smart because yeah. it was a, once again, an iconic, extremely successful film. People listed as the, you know, the top five war films, things like that. They made the money back. In other words, we're at zero. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you make a film, if you make a film for a million dollars, you're at zero when you're at three million mm -hmm. through the door. Sure. Okay. They made the money back the first day. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. it was amazing. And yeah. of course, it led to. Uh, it led to a call from Rob, like the next day <laughs> after <laughs> the premiere, uh, asking me. He said. I don't have a lot of time to talk. I got a guy from, uh, from Variety on the phone with. Um, if we do a sequel, will you do it? And I said, yes. He said, okay, I'll talk to you later. And that's how we wound up. <laughs> he wanted up. to put it in the article, probably. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's how we wound up doing The Devil's Rejects. 
and, and here are the devil's rejects. Now, was that how? How did that differ from the first? More money, uh, not as no. Toxic. I think the money was really pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, Rob had a lot more control, and in the meantime, he had learned a lot, just mm -hmm. about how to make a film. Okay, from doing the first one, because mm -hmm. um, he's very smart, picked up on stuff, and. Um, so it was an easier shoot, and I spent much less time tweaking dialogue and mm -hmm. whatnot because he got a lock on my craziness, and he so he went there. 